Hi, my name is John Petrucci. Welcome to my video. I'm going to be discussing and demonstrating various concepts, ideas, and approaches that have helped develop my style and sound. And hopefully you'll walk away with some insight on practicing and songwriting and developing your overall skills as a player. But before we start, let's make sure we're in tune. Here is my open A string. Get that in tune with your A string and then tune the rest of the guitar to that. I'll see you when you're done. Okay, I'd like to begin with some warm-up exercises, and we're going to start with a couple that don't involve the guitar at all. So put your guitar aside for a second. And what we're going to do here is we're going to stretch the muscles that basically are involved when you're playing guitar. And I really think this is essential to having a productive practice session or gig. And it's also essential to not hurting yourself and uh, cramping up. And it's very similar to what an athlete would do before they went in to play a game or do some exercising. Okay, the first one begins with stretching the back and shoulders and arms. And guitar players tend to slouch when we practice, so these are really important. I'm going to start with stretching your arm across your chest. Ooh, my arm just cracked, and yours might also. But you can feel it basically right through your back and your shoulder and your arm. And you should hold these stretches for about 10 seconds each. And then do the same thing with the other arm. Then after that, you can pull your elbow up over your head like this. And you can feel that stretch right through here and in through your back. And then once you do that, you can repeat these exercises as many times as possible. You can move on to your wrists. And we're going to start with stretching this part of the wrist by pulling your hand gently towards you. Don't pull too hard. You don't want to hurt yourself. Just feel it sort of warmly burn through here. Hold that for 10 seconds. And then do the opposite this way. And you can feel that burn through here. Don't pull too hard and don't crack your knuckles. You're just trying to stretch the wrist. The last stretch is your thumb. And what you're going to do is gently pull your thumb towards your arm this way. And you can feel the muscle stretch throughout here. And then repeat the same procedure with the other hand. And you can do this as many times as you feel necessary. And you should hold each stretch once again for 10 seconds each. Now let's move on to massages. Okay, basically, when we massage the muscle, we're stimulating blood flow. And this type of thing you can do in between exercises or during a practice session. I even do this during a gig. So let me show you the areas that might be uh, sore or cramped up. Basically, it starts with your shoulder muscles, the front of your shoulder, up in here. And use a pretty strong amount of pressure. You can use either your thumb or the heel of your hand or your fingertips. And then the outside of your forearm, this tends to cramp up a lot. And then your hand, and once again you can use your thumb and you can massage through your palm by using pretty strong pressure. And you can also individually do your fingers like this, going all the way to the tips. And this is great, once again, in between exercises. It really helps to keep your hands limber and loose. And there are other simple things you can do, but just like rubbing one hand with the next and whatnot. 
And these type of exercises between the stretching and massaging should get you prepared to actually play the instrument. And the great thing about these is that you don't have to be playing. This could be as you're walking into a session or if you have a couple of minutes before you go on stage or whatever. And it should help you have a more productive practice or gig and also prevent injury, which is very important. Okay, now I'd like to demonstrate some warm-up exercises applied to the guitar. So pick up your guitars again. And basically what I'm going to show you is a few exercises concentrating on the stretching and independence of the left hand and a few exercises concentrating on the freedom and accuracy of the right hand and then we'll combine the two. Remember the goal here is not to develop mega speed but really just to warm up your hands and get them comfortable so later on we can accomplish some bigger tasks. So first let's work on the first left hand exercise. I suggest that you start this exercise higher up on the neck because once we get into some stretches it's going to be a little bit difficult as you go down low where the frets are bigger. And basically your right hand isn't really that important right now. I was playing the notes separately. You can play them as chords if you'd like. You can play them without a pick. It really doesn't matter. We're concentrating on the left hand. Make sure that the notes ring out clearly because what we're really working on is the stretching and independence of your left hand. Also use a pretty strong pressure. Now what's happening here is that I'm playing on four adjacent strings with a basic chord shape. It sounds pretty ugly. In fact, most of these chord shapes sound ugly, so turn your volume down when you practice. And then we're taking the two inside fingers, two and three, and we're reversing them like this. Then we're taking your two outside fingers, one and four, and reversing them. And then taking the two inside fingers and putting them back to their starting position. The next step is to just move up the chord shape to the next string group so between the A and the B string and repeat the same motion and then move up to the last string group between the low E and the G string and repeat the same four chords again. Okay, what I just played is the continuation of the first warm-up exercise. Basically, when you're through, you're going to have a sequence of stretches that continue down the neck. So this is considered part two. And what I did is I started in our original position, which was between the low E and the G, and we were in the tenth position, and I stretched the first finger down a half step and kept the rest where they were, and did the same sequence of finger moves. So in other words, then reversing the two middle fingers, then the two outer, and then the two middle again, and just continued up to the next string group, and then to the final string group again. Alright, that was part three of the exercise. And at the end of part two, we ended up with this position between the first string groups. Now what you're going to do is put your fingers back in order, and while leaving your third and fourth where they are, stretch your second down a half step. 
So we have this shape. And once again, continue with the moves all the way up the string groups. Now for the final part. Okay, that was the final part, and if you haven't guessed already, what we did is we moved our third finger down a half step while keeping the pinky where it was. So we had this shape, this time the stretch is between your third and fourth finger, and continue with the pattern until we got up to the first set of strings again. And then all you do is you bring your pinky down a half step, which brings you to the exact same shape that you started with, but you're a half step lower because we started originally in the 10th position, now we're in the 9th position. And that's the first warm-up exercise. Okay, the second warm-up exercise for your left hand is basically a variation of the one that we just finished. You can start in the 10th position again with the same setup, and we're going to do the same moves. <laughs> Except this time, we're going to do some different stretches with the left hand. And by the way, you don't have to arpeggiate the notes. You can just strum the chords if you'd like. Okay, this stretch was different in that instead of moving one finger down a half step, we move the first finger down a half step and the fourth finger up a half step. So we have a double stretch between the third and the fourth and the first and the second. And then we did the same exact moves. <laughs> Okay, now we'll do the final variation on this exercise, and this involves yet a larger stretch. Here's how it goes. All right, what we did here on the final variation is instead of just having a stretch between the first and second and the third and fourth, we have a half step stretch now between every finger. So you do that by moving your first finger down yet another half step and then your second finger down a half step as well. <laughs> Remember when doing these exercises to make sure that the notes ring clearly and see just how far down the neck you can go by moving downward by half steps. Now, for all you crazy guitarists out there, there is one more variation that involves some super stretches. Remember, don't hurt yourself. As you can see, I started out in a lower position, which made the final stretch a lot more difficult. Let me break it down for you now. With this exercise, instead of having all your fingers on adjacent strings, we start with the two middle fingers, two and three, on the two middle strings, D and G, and your first and fourth fingers on the low and high E strings. And then you just continue with the same moves that we've been doing throughout. The moves from here should look familiar. We move the first finger down a half step, and the fourth finger up a half step, and then the first finger down one more half step, and the second finger down another half step, creating a full step between each finger for the ultimate stretch. 
What I usually do is I play these exercises in sequence, one after the next without stopping. I start on the 12th or 10th fret and work my way down chromatically until I can't stretch anymore. Now let's turn our attention to right hand exercises and you can give your left hand a rest. The next exercise concentrates on the flow and precision of the right hand and has many variations. So let me demonstrate it in its basic form. As you just heard, that exercise involved notes that were being arpeggiated intervallically. So let's talk about the left hand shapes that I was going through. It's based off of a major bar chord form with an added third, except you're playing the notes separately. And then we just sort of intervallically disperse those notes. Now that bar chord is moved up through a progression that doesn't make too much sense but at least makes the exercise a little bit more interesting. It goes A major, C major, E major, C sharp major, G major, B major, and F sharp major. All right, now let me show you the pattern that we're doing throughout the chord or arpeggio. We're starting on the root, we're skipping a string, and going to the next note in the arpeggio. Then you're going to the second note of the arpeggio, in this case which is E, skipping a string again. Then to the third note of the arpeggio, the fourth, So we have remember to pick down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. To descend, you start on the added third, which is C sharp on the E string, and skip down to the G string then up to the B and skip down to the D, up to the G, skip to the A, up to the D string and skip to the E. Remember once again to keep your right hand picking consistent. Down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. Don't let that falter at all. So here's what it sounds like when you combine the two. And then from there, just go through the sequence of chords that I outlined earlier, and you have the entire exercise. Okay, now that you know the initial exercise, all the variations involve the right hand and we're going to concentrate on our picking. First of all, instead of starting with a down stroke and using down, up, down, up, down, up, do the same exercise starting on an up stroke and consistently playing up, down, up, down, up, down throughout the entire exercise. That's going to look like this. It might be a little bit more difficult at first, but the reason we're doing this is so in any situation you'll be able to pick 
you're not always going to have the comfort of starting on your favorite stroke, whether it's down or up. You should be able to sort of get through anything that comes your way. Now the other variations involve playing more than one time on each note. We're going to start with playing twice on each note, then three times on each note, and then finally four times on each note. Not only that, but starting each sequence with a down and then with an up. So let me demonstrate through the one chord what these will look like on your right hand. We'll start with the doubles, starting on a down. Then double starting with an up. Then three times starting with a down. Three times starting with an up. Four times starting with down. And finally, four times starting with an up stroke. All right, what you're going to do is play each one of those variations through the entire chord sequence. Just remember to keep the notes very even and also to keep that consistent alternate picking, especially when you're playing triplets going from one string to the next because there's an odd amount of notes per string. Really, really watch that you are keeping a consistent down, up, down, up. Now let me demonstrate what it would sound like playing two notes per string through the entire sequence, just so you can have an example. basically have technique broken down into four categories. One is scalar or linear examples, two is arpeggiated examples, three is left hand or legato playing, and four is sweep picking. And what I do is I have files in a file cabinet and I collect information from videos and books and lessons and whatever and I file them according to topic. If it's an arpeggio thing that I learn from a magazine, I rip it out and stick it into the arpeggio section. And then when it comes time to practice, instead of saying, oh, there's millions of things, how am I going to practice all this stuff? Basically, I make a master list of what's in all those files. And that list changes from day to day. You constantly add to it. And you sit down and you basically customize a practice session. So let's say you have about two hours to practice. I personally have four categories, so I'd pick one item from each one of those categories and practice that item for a half hour. Move on to the next, practice that for a half hour. And then by the time I'm done, after two hours, I've covered the entire topic of technique. Okay, now that we concentrated on the left hand and the right hand individually, let me show you a few exercises that are equally effective for both hands. Okay, this exercise starts with your first finger on the low E string on the first fret in the first position skips over the A string, goes with your second finger on the D string on the note E, and then your third finger on the G string on the note B flat, and your fourth finger 
on the high E string on the note A flat. And your right hand is picking, once again, down, up, down, up. Now the next step is to simply flip your hand, sort of like a mirror image. So your first finger is now on the high E, and your fourth finger is on the low E. And start from the high E and go down to low E with the picking, down, up, down, up. And combine the two. What I did after that is I ascended chromatically, and you should take this all the way up to the 12th fret, and then descend using a similar but slightly different pattern. Here's how it goes. Okay, all I did there is instead of starting on the first finger and ascending, one, two, three, four, we started on the, on the pinky on the high E and descended four, three, two, one. Once again, picking alternately. And then we reversed that image like a mirror and started on the fourth finger once again on the low E. All right, since this exercise involves alternate picking through string skips, make sure that your right hand picking is very accurate and that you keep your pick close to the strings so you don't hit the string that you're actually skipping. It's called efficiency of motion. Now, you should also practice the same exact exercise starting on an upstroke as well to make sure that you're ambipixtrous. No. <laughs> That was a slight variation on the exercise that we just did. Instead of playing the notes in order, one, two, three, four, I'm playing one, three, four, two, one, three, four, two. And the notes and skips are exactly the same. Make sure you keep the picking alternate. Let me show you now the descending version. All right, that was another slight variation, this time on the descending pattern. Instead of playing 4, 3, 2, 1, you play 4, 2, 1, 3, 4, 2, 1, 3, and continue that pattern down the neck chromatically. Remember to keep your picking alternate the entire time. And that will wrap up our warm-up exercises. I usually play these type of exercises for, I guess, about 10 to 20 minutes before actually tackling some more difficult practicing or a gig or whatever. And it usually helps to get both hands acclimated to the guitar, especially when you're cold. So have fun and make sure you warm up. In order to realize our creative visions, it's essential that we develop the craft of our instrument, which leads us to the area of technique. I'm going to show you a whole bunch of different exercises that concentrate on developing speed and accuracy. Now for me, the most effective tool for developing these areas is the metronome. Whether that metronome is a simple click or a drum machine or sequencer isn't important. The important thing is that there's a steady and even pulse. Now practicing and playing to a metronome will help you to play accurately at any speed and also show you how to subdivide the beat any which way that you want. Now the first exercise involves a very familiar looking shape. It's based off of an A major scale in the fourth position, two octaves. So let me show you that fingering first. This exercise involves playing to a steady pulse. In other words, the speed or tempo of the click is not going to change, 
but how we subdivide that click is going to change. First we'll start with playing one note per beat, which is chord notes. Now I have a metronome setting of 66 beats per minute, which is really slow, but by the time we're done, you're going to be playing a lot of notes per beat, so it's important that we start slow. Remember also to keep a consistent down, up, down, up, down, up picking pattern the entire time. Here is chord notes to the metronome. Three, four. Now when you're playing this, remember it might seem easy, but really concentrate getting even spacing between all those notes. It's actually more difficult when you have a lot of space in between the clicks. Now let me demonstrate eighth notes to the metronome. This would be two notes per beat. Three, four. And now triplets, which is three notes to the beat. Three, four. The next division is sixteenth notes, four notes per beat. Three, four. Now we're getting a bit faster. The next division is six notes per beat, or sixteenth note triplets. And the last group is thirty second notes, or eight notes per beat. And this is going to be quite faster than what we started. But remember, the pulse didn't change at all. It's just the division of that pulse. Three, four. Okay, now that you're familiar with playing to a metronome and subdividing the beats, I'd like to show you how to increase your speed. And what we're going to do here is we're going to develop accuracy at high speeds. The basic concept is you start with a slow tempo on the metronome, play the exercise or example as many times until you've mastered it at that tempo, and then increase the metronome about 8 beats per minute, and then play the exercise over and over at that tempo, increase it, and so on, until you get to your desired tempo. I'm going to demonstrate this with an exercise that uses chromatics, four fingers in a row, and they're played as sixteenth notes to the metronome. Let me show you the exercise first, then I'll show you how to develop the speed. As I mentioned, this exercise is based off of a sixteenth note pattern, which means you're going to be playing four notes per beat. Besides concentrating on getting those notes to fall evenly over each click, you should also accent every four notes. In other words, every time the click comes down, accent with a harder pick stroke. So your group of four would sound like this. etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Now what this is going to enable you to do is when you get faster and faster, that accent will be your reference point. 
In other words, at a slow tempo, your accent might just sound like etc. And you'll be able to know where you are. But at a faster tempo, when the notes are whizzing by, your accent might be... In other words... And that's how you know exactly where you are when you're playing at fast tempos. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you how I would take this exercise and develop it speed-wise. Now, the first thing you have to do is you have to get a goal tempo. Let's say our goal tempo for today is 200 beats per minute. Now, normally, I would start this pretty low on the metronome, maybe about 100 or so, and it would take me quite a while to get to 200. But for the video's purpose, I'll start at about 120, and I'll increase it in larger in increments than I would normally do just to save some time. And what's going to happen is by the time I get to 200, hopefully not only should it be wound, but it should also be clean. Another thing to keep in mind is your technique that you're using when you're playing slow should be the same technique that you use when you're playing fast. In other words, when you're playing slow, you're programming in your technique. So when you play fast, be consistent in your hand position and also in your left hand position, your right and left. Okay, here we go. Okay, so we finally reached 200. Now, like I said before, normally that would take a lot longer because I'd go in increments of 8. Now, if you find at any point along that development that you just don't have it, it's not coming together, it's not clean, like I'm going up to 200. If 176, I felt like I was pushing it, it's a good idea to back the metronome down. Go to a slower speed. So. I was at 200, let's say that was difficult, I'll go back down to about 170. Try to get comfortable there first. go back up to 200 and see how it feels. On a similar note, if you reach this desired speed that you're going to and you still want to push the envelope a little further, what you can do is, let's say you want to hit 208 now. Go past 208, go to like 216, and just kill yourself, and then go back to 208, and that tempo will feel a lot easier. Let's attempt that. That was very difficult. Let's go back down to 208 and see if it's any easier now.
Okay, so it's pretty much there. So you get the idea about pushing the envelope and then going back. Just remember, make sure that you're clean and accurate. And remember to accent the notes as well. Okay, now I'd like to demonstrate the same technique, building speed and accuracy, but this time with a 16th note triplet pattern. You're going to play six notes per beat, and it's based off of a three note per string pattern in E minor. So here it goes. One, two, three, four. Okay, then you would follow the same steps to get to your goal tempo. Let's say your goal tempo in this case is about 126. Let's hear what it sounds like at that tempo. One, two, three, four. My first band experience, technically, was actually the first time I even picked up a guitar when I started again when I was 12. And these uh, friends of mine, actually our ex-keyboard player, everybody would join, everybody would uh, gather at his house because he had a piano. And I remember they were playing uh, some Neil Young, they were playing Hey Hey My My, and they assigned me the little down, 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 down. That was my part, and I sat there getting that, and I guess that was kind of a bad experience. Another good way to develop speed is to work on what I call fragments or segments. That is, if you have a long exercise or passage that's really difficult to play, instead of trying to swallow the whole thing, take bites. Work on small sections and develop that section and then connect them one by one until you have the big picture. This way you can concentrate on one little thing at a time as opposed to tons of notes. Now I have several examples of what I call scale fragments and they're little patterns that you just play over and over and over and over and eventually I'll show you how to develop these into long scale sequences that you can use in soloing and whatnot. So let's start by going through the different scale fragments.
All of the examples I just played were in the key of G major. You can play these anywhere on the neck between any two strings. It doesn't really matter. You can practice them chromatically, meaning if you were playing this one, perhaps play it four times in each position and then move up a half step. Or you can pick a key and play them diatonically. In other words, conform your fingers to the notes in the key. You can practice these scale fragments with the metronome, as we discussed, or there's a couple of other ways to develop speed. First way involves playing the exercise over and over and over, but starting in a slow tempo and gradually increasing the speed and then bringing it back down to a slow tempo. So you're almost like revving, you're almost revving your playing. And as you do this, as you play faster, you can also vary the degree of dynamics that you pick with. You can pick harder or softer. It's a really good way to develop the speed. Here's an example. Another way of developing speed is by playing the exercise over and over and over, but this time playing consistently at a slow to moderate tempo and then sort of blasting out a fast tempo only a couple of times. So in other words, you're jogging for a while, then you're going to sprint for a second and go back to jogging. This is a way to build stamina as well as speed. Sounds like this. Now, a fun thing to do when you're working on all these exercises, since they're pretty similar, some of them are using 16th notes and some are 16th note triplets, is to sort of interact. In other words, mix them together. Like, you might have one that sounds like... which is what I've been playing for the last couple of seconds. And there was another one that went... There was also another one that went... Try combining some of these exercises randomly and use your imagination. It might sound something like this. Each one of these fragments could now be used in a longer sequence of notes, perhaps a run through a scale or whatnot. So let me show you how a few of these can be developed. One, two, three, four. You should recognize the first part of that as the three note per string fragment that we did before. Except I transposed it to the key of A and played it through an A major scale. And 
the sequence consisted of playing that same pattern starting from each string. And then using the descending pattern to do the same thing. You can play these patterns through the scales, you can change positions, you can play and repeat the sequence in any position as many times as you want, just kind of mix it up and that makes for a good run in a solo if you're trying to build some tension. I'll demonstrate that a little bit later. Let's move on to another long sequence of notes that's based off of another fragment. And here's the descending version of that. Okay, once again, hopefully you recognize the little fragments that originated these little runs. And descending, while it's fresh in our mind, came from that and sounded like this. And ascending was pretty much the same thing, except starting on the first finger. It also has a little bit of the triplet in there. But we're just arranging the notes so that it works out to be a 16th note pattern. Here's another example using a fragment that includes string skipping. Now with this one, instead of moving up the neck, playing three notes per string, I stayed in the same position because it facilitates skipping strings without having to do any position changes. So instead of having to go something awkward like that, we're staying in the same position. So the scale shape I'm doing has a repeated E, but we don't really hear that repeated E because we're skipping strings. Here's the pattern slow. Let's just do one more 16th note pattern through a scale, once again using one of the fragments that we learned earlier. Here it is slow. See if you can recognize the fragments in this one. OK, 
Okay, now that we have all the scalar technique under our hands, let me show you how this can be applied to improvising. I'm going to solo over progression in D minor, basically using D Dorian and D minor scales, and I'm going to throw in a couple of these 16th note runs, and you can see the way it interacts with the melodies and whatnot. And once you get a taste of this, maybe you can try it in your own solos. When I first started playing, I probably had some of the same typical influences that kids my age had. Uh, it was like Black Sabbath and Zeppelin and The Who and Iron Maiden. And then I started to get more drawn towards the guitar players. And as I played more, I was drawn to players that really had unique style. I was really into Rush and Alex Lifeson and Steve Howe with Yes, Randy Rhodes. And, then I finally discovered Steve Morse, and my life changed. <laughs> I heard the bash for the first time, and I was just like, this is unreal. Got every Dregs album, and started getting into Steve and the Dregs, and Al Demiola and Alan Holdsworth. I had a similar experience here in Steve Ray Vaughan for the first time, like, just blown away. One of the more difficult techniques for most guitarists is using alternate picking through arpeggios. Now this has been something that's been difficult uh, for me for a while and it's actually making me kind of mad so I analyzed what the problem was and I came up with an interesting little fact. First of all, the problem always seemed to arise when I was encountering what I call inside the string picking. Now that to me is really difficult because it seems like your pick is kind of trapped in between these two strings as opposed to playing on the outside of the strings like this. Where it feels like you have a bit more freedom of motion to experiment and see if this is a problem for you, I suggest playing two notes on adjacent strings, let's say A on the G string and D on the B string, and first try picking them starting with a downstroke and then with an upstroke, and let's see how that feels. Try it at various tempos, see how fast you can get it. Now do the same thing, but start on an upstroke and go up, down, up, down. You're going to encounter that inside of the string picking 
phenomena. Let's try that. Now my right hand immediately starts to tense up as soon as I encounter that uh, inside of the string technique and I think it's because I feel like I'm sort of trapped and I have no range of motion. This is usually a problem for most guitar players. Some guys have this taken care of and uh, we'll have to shoot them all. But anyway, how do you practice this? How do you get around this? Well very simply, you just practice the motion that you're having a problem with. Now, this could be very boring if you sit there doing that for any period of time that's going to make it effective. So what I've done is I've come up with a little etude that practices and concentrates on the inside of the string picking. And by the way, if you ever have something that you're trying to work on and you, you need to develop it, come up with some little progression or etude or song. It makes it a lot more interesting. So let me demonstrate it for you now slow and then I'll play it up to tempo. Now I'm going to demonstrate this up to speed with the metronome. Make sure that the pick strokes are even and that you maintain, in this case, down, up, down, up, down, up, because we're starting on a higher string and going to a lower string, which once again makes us encounter this inside of the string technique. So here we go. Now that exercise specifically narrows down the problem and concentrates only on that problem. But the thing is you're going to encounter this picking hang up through an arpeggio. In other words, some part of the arpeggio will have, you'll have no problem playing and other parts you might have this inside of the string thing. Let me demonstrate on a major arpeggio. If I play G major in the seventh position, I have down, up, down, up. Now the initial down, up isn't a problem. Either is the next down. But it's when you go to the D on the G string, you have the inside of the string picking down, up. So in order to play that quickly, you're going to have to overcome that little problem right there. So once again, instead of practicing that same arpeggio over and over, I came up with another little etude that incorporates major and minor arpeggios and that picking hang up is kind of snuck in the middle of the arpeggio. So it's not just only concentrating on that, but it's incorporating it into a larger picture. Here it is slow. Now I've added an extra challenge to this one because not only are we working on the picking hang up but we're skipping strings while doing that hang up. Let me show you where that happens. Right over here between the D and its octave, between the D and the C, between the D and the B. 
you're playing up, down, up, down, and also trying not to hit the B string while you're at it. Here it is up to tempo. I first picked up the guitar when I was 12, and I didn't take any formal lessons. Um, I took music theory my last two years in high school, so I had two years of that, and I went to Berkeley right out of high school. Um, a couple of times I had some scattered lessons before Berkeley. I took a few lessons to try to prepare myself, and I remember going to group classes with a friend of mine, but I never really took any formal continuous lessons. By the time I went to Berkeley, I, I had been uh, working on technique and chops and stuff like that, and I had a couple of years of classical music theory. So when I came into Berkeley, all the things like arranging and sight singing and harmony and a jazz perspective, I had no clue. So I remember taking the placement and just getting in like level one of everything and starting from scratch. And uh, I, I think that the most I learned there was in harmony and about chord structure and progressions and, and also how to continue to learn because that was one of the things that I kind of picked up on is that there's such a resource out there whether you're going to school or not. I mean, it's great to go to school because you have the discipline of going every day. But there's just so many resources out there and the students that really applied themselves whether it was to the library, the listening rooms or attending recitals they really excelled and the ones that just kinda sat there and thought it was all gonna come to them eventually weren't there anymore. Now I'd like to concentrate on left hand string what we're going to do is we're going to work on some scale fragments once again, but instead of picking them, we'll play them legato. In other words, we'll use all hammer-ons and pull-offs. And basically, I'm going to show you a couple of different patterns, and then I'll show you how to practice them. So let's start with the legato patterns. Okay, this is how we're going to practice these. You're going to play each pattern to a watch this time for a minute each. If you feel like you need more, you can do each for two minutes or three if you'd like. The idea is to not stop. Do one exercise into the next, a minute each. And you can play them at varying speeds. Just make sure that the notes are clean and that you're using complete legato technique. Now, with the last couple, notice I did pick except I only picked when I was ascending from the D string to the G. Happened right over here. So in this case it was on the C sharp. That's the only other time you're going to pick. Also when you practice these you don't have to stay in the positions that I just showed. You can practice them on any string. You could stretch your fingers out. You can play them 
in any position, in any key, diatonically or chromatically. Let me demonstrate a little bit. Remember, one minute each without stopping. That's the idea. Okay, once you get those all practiced, I suggest that you do our little massage thing that we talked about in the beginning and also stretch your wrists because it's time to take those fragments and put them into expanded sequences through scales using very little picking. Once again, this is called legato. Here's the first exercise. Okay, basically what I did is I took one of the fragments, the one that went like this, and also another one that went like this, and combined them ascending through an A major scale. Descending, we shifted up to the next position in the key and worked our way back down the scale. Let me play the two scale positions by themselves, just so you know what they sound like straight through. And you can practice that sequence between any two positions in any key or even using nonsense patterns, just shifting up by half steps, maybe something like this. Now let's hear the original pattern up to speed. Here's one more legato example. This one is in the key of E minor and it shifts positions quite a number of times. So practice it slowly and make sure that you get those position shifts clean and clear. This also involves some right hand tapping. Here it is slow. Let's break this down into segments so you can practice each section and then put it all together. It's basically ascending in three octaves and the pattern repeats. Here it is. So it's starting on F sharp and ending on E. And then starting on F sharp an octave higher. The exact same thing, and then one octave higher, starting on the B string. So 
So this is a perfect example of practicing segments and then connecting all of them to get the whole run. Because you might just want to practice each octave at a time. Then put it together. When you get to the top, you're tapping the G on the high E string, and it's basically a double tap. And then you're tapping A, and then back down to G. So you could practice that small fragment a few times and get that under your fingers. And descending, we have another three octave pattern. So you can practice each one of them as a fragment, and just master that octave. and put them all together. Now I'm going to play the whole thing, ascending and descending up to tempo. When we first started the band, we were all 17 or 18 years old. Uh, so the last album that we just put out, I mean, it's like almost 10 years later. So I think we've all matured as songwriters. And, you know, we listen to the old demos and whatnot. And uh, there's bootlegs of those demos and stuff. And it's just like, oh, my God, what were we thinking, you know? So it's def the music and writing has definitely evolved. To wrap up the topic of technique, I'd like to introduce a different style of picking other than alternate. It's called sweep picking, and some of you may be familiar with this technique, some of you may not be, but in either case, I'd like to offer you my exercises and things like that that basically isolate the technique, and then you can expand and apply it to things that you might already know. Now, I usually apply sweep picking to arpeggios and not really to scalar examples. And I also use it in a way where it's sort of a weapon or a tool to execute a fast flurry of notes. Let me show you a couple of exercises that work on the technique. <laughs> All right, there's two things to keep in mind when working on this exercise. One of them is to separate the notes of the left hand. In other words, you're not playing chords, but you're separating the notes and playing arpeggios. And also, with the right hand, you want to separate the notes as well. In other words, don't strum them all together, but push down on the pick so it knocks into the next string sort of falling from string to string. You don't want to make separate motions like this. You want to push the pick down, 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 and then up, 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 pushing against the strings. Now you can actually mute the strings and work on just the right hand. You don't want it to sound like this. You want the separation. The left hand pattern is very similar to some of the warm up exercises we were doing. It involves four finger mirror type shapes. It starts one, two, three, four. 
Then reverse and go one, two, three, four again, starting on the high E. Move up a half step and play four, three, two, one from the D to the E string. Do the mirror image and play four, three, two, one from the E to the D. Here it is again. And then simply move it up, continuing in half steps. You can also play this on different string groups if you want. Okay, just as a fun variation, you can take this technique and just mutate the notes of the left hand, and I came up with, once again, another etude using the sweeping technique. It goes like this. Here it is played to the metronome at 176 as 16th notes up to speed. To break this down, we're using the exact same pattern as the exercise. In other words, four notes ascending and four notes descending, and then doing the same thing starting on the pinky except I just changed the notes. We start on E, and we're playing a power chord, E, and then the fifth B, and then we're doubling that, E and B. And for the reverse, we're playing an A diminished seventh chord, starting on F sharp and descending to A. F sharp, E flat, C, and A. Then, we're going down a minor third, and we're doing an F-sharp diminished seventh. So we have F-sharp, A, C natural, and E-flat, which is actually the same thing as an A diminished seventh in another inversion. And for the reverse, we're playing a D-flat power chord, which is D-flat and the fifth A-flat. But we're starting on the A-flat and descending. And to finish it up, we're doing the original exercise. Which ends us up on E flat, a half step away, to start over again. Here's one more sweet picking exercise. This one's applied to arpeggios. Let me demonstrate it for you slowly. This pattern is based off a major arpeggio, so let's go through the different arpeggios and the chords that they come from. First one is D, coming from this chord fingering, with an added fifth, A. The second one is F sharp, based off of an F sharp bar chord, with an added third. The next one is E major, based off of this chord form, once again with an added fifth. And the last one is A major, based off of this bar chord with an added third. Starting with D, the picking goes down, 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 down. When you get to the A, that's when you're going to reverse and play an upstroke and pull off to the F sharp. 
and then the rest of the arpeggio is descending using all upstrokes. Remember to separate the notes, you're not playing a chord. When you get to the next arpeggio, F sharp, you're still continuing with an up. In fact, you can almost consider it the third of the D arpeggio. So you're kind of finishing up the D arpeggio. Because after that, we're going to repeat the F sharp and start with a downstroke and outline the F sharp major arpeggio. Down, 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 and then up on the A sharp. Pull off to the F sharp and continue all consecutive upstrokes to finish off the arpeggio. So from the D to the F sharp, it sounds like this. Then we're going to move up to G sharp, which is the third of E, and basically we're going to follow the same exact pattern. So starting with a down, reverse at the top where the fifth is, do a pull off and come back down using all ups. Repeat the third of the chord, which is G sharp, and then move up a half step and play the A major arpeggio the same way. And that's it. Here it is up to tempo. The majority of our writing processes together as a band, somebody usually has a, a progression or groove or an idea and uh, they bring that in and it's basically we just jam on it. We set the tape recorder and just kind of go for it and out of those jams some solid ideas start to happen and we start working on arrangements and before you know it we have a song. Do you write lyrics yourself at all? Yes, I, I write lyrics and I'm really really interested in, in lyric and melody and how that contributes to the song, the, the real importance of of the lyrics and the melody and the vocalist. The cool thing is that all of us were basically influenced by the same bands and they happen, a lot of them happen to be progressive like Rush and Yes and the Dregs and Genesis and even Zappa's music. So when we all got together at Berkeley it just kind of naturally came out this this type of music in Odd Times and, and uh, even even you know, using the harmony, harmony that was a little bit uh, more experimental or creative and whatnot, and it was just kind of a natural direction for us all. We've been focusing in a lot on developing techniques for soloing and chop building, but let's switch gears now and concentrate on building your chord vocabulary. What we're going to do is we're going to take the ever faithful power chord by adding certain notes to these chords we're going to mutate them and we're going to add some colors and drama into basic chord progressions. So let's first make sure everybody knows what the power chord is. Basically it's a two note chord consisting of a root and fifth. For example, a B power chord would consist of B and the fifth F sharp. Now you could expand and you can double the B, or you can put the fifth in the bass which makes the chord sound even heavier, so the F sharp will be below the B. This is really effective. And one other type that's not really a typical power chord, but it's a progressive power chord. You take the root, the fifth, and you add the ninth on top. Sounds like this. To explore this topic a little bit further, you have to understand 
two things. First of all, which notes can be added to the power chords, and second of all, how those notes affect the name of the chord and also the function of the chord in the progression. First of all, we have the root and fifth, which you see as an example. If we add an E or a third to that, we have a C major chord. If we add an E flat to that, which is a minor third, we have a C minor chord. If we add a second or ninth to that, we have what's called a suspended second chord. In this case, it would be a D. If we add a fourth to that, we have what's called a suspended fourth. In this case, the fourth would be... All of those chords added one note to the power chord and drastically changed the sound. Now let's go through some chords that add two notes. If we add the major third and the major seventh, we have a major seventh chord. So you'd have the power chord, the major third E, and the major seventh B. If we add the minor third and a flat seventh, we have a minor seventh chord. In this case, it would be an E flat, and a B flat. Add it to the power chord. If we add a major third and a flat seven, we have what's called a dominant seventh chord. In this case, E is a major third, B flat is a flat seventh. Add it to the power chord. And now there are a couple of chords which I call add nine chords. What they are, major and minor chords, so we're going to have a major and minor third added, and on top of that, the ninth as well. A major add nine would add a major third E and a nine D. A minor add nine would add the flat third, E flat, and the ninth D. Now let's talk about how the eleventh added to the power chord changes the name. We'll keep the major third and we'll add an eleventh and we end up with a major add eleventh. Here's the power chord, here's the major third, here's the eleventh. Don't worry, we won't be playing these fingerings. And the final chord is a minor 11th chord where we add three notes, the minor third, the flat seven, and also the 11th, which once again is F. And just to make this easier for now, we'll put the fifth in the bass. Now what this new information allows us to do is to take a simple chord progression that you wrote, maybe you have a great melody going, and develop the sound of the chords to add some spice. Let's say the chord progression we have is all power chords A, F to G. Very, very typical. By adding some of these intervals and creating these more interesting chords, perhaps we can make it sound a little bit more interesting or we can take it in a more dramatic direction. So I'll turn the A into an A minor add 9. turn the F into an F sus2, and maybe the G into a G sus2. So what started out as now it sounds like That's the basic picture. Now, unfortunately, when you're trying to play this stuff loud and heavy, it's going to sound pretty bad because of the dissonance of the intervals. I know you don't want to hear this, but I'll demonstrate. So 
Some of them don't sound that bad, but once we start getting to 11ths and 7ths, believe me, it's horrible. People will cringe. So here's where orchestration comes into play. What we're going to do is we're going to divide the part up into two separate parts. And you can do this when you're recording, or you can do it in a band. If you have a bass and guitar, you can divide the parts up. Or if you have two guitar players or guitar and keyboards, the concept is one guy plays the power chord or the root and the fifth, and the other guy plays the added tension. Sometimes it's either one note, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's three. So I have a couple of examples that demonstrate how, in our case, open strings added to power chords will create some interesting sounds. So let's go through the different chords we can create, and then we'll make a little song out of it. The first power chord was an A. We added a second to it and it created an A suspended second. The second power chord was a B. We added a fourth to it and we created a suspended fourth. The third power chord was a C. We added a major third and a major seven and it turns into a C major seven. The next power chord was a C sharp. We added a B and an E and created a C sharp minor seventh. The next power chord was a D with the fifth in the bass. We added on a major third and an 11 and created a major add 11 chord. The next chord was a C. We added on a D and an E and we created a major add nine. The next chord was an A. We added on a C and a B, which is a minor third and a ninth, and we created a minor add nine chord. Next chord was a G. We added on an A, and we created another suspended second, G sus two. And the chord after that had F sharp by itself, in the bass, and we added on a D, an A, and an E. So what we have created is a major chord with an added ninth, but the third is in the bass. Next chord was an F sharp. We added on an A, a B, and an E, and we created an F sharp minor 11 chord. Chord after that was an F. We added on a G, and we created an F sus2. After that we had an E and first we made an E suspended fourth by adding on the fourth A and then we made an E major by adding on the third G sharp. So we had The next chord was an F sharp. We added on an A sharp, a B and an E and we came up with an F sharp 7, add 11. The chord after that was an A. We added on a B and a C sharp to create a major add 9. And the second to last chord was a B and we added on a D sharp and an E to create a major with an added 11th. And we end the whole thing up on a C-sharp minor 7. Okay, so I'd like to demonstrate with the sequencer what this sounds like with the two parts divided up. So I'll play with a heavy sound, the power chords, and the sequencer will play the picking part that I demonstrated before. And instead of having an ugly mess trying to play it all together with distortion, we have a nice 
collaboration of the two parts. And this is great when you're recording because you can add a lot of fidelity. You can have a great heavy sound underneath and then with an acoustic or a super clean guitar you can do the picking or that could be piano, whatever. It adds a lot of dimension to your writing. So let's hear what that sounds like. As you can see, our power chord has come a pretty long way. We started with some really basic nonsense and we came up with some pretty cool sounding chords. Now, granted, the progression that I created for that exercise really doesn't make too much sense. So, let me show you a little song that incorporates a lot of those chords and is more like a piece of music. I mean, you can use it for uh, background to a vocal part or it could be backing up a solo or whatnot, but it uses basic power chords that I'll be playing and the sequencer will be playing the second guitar part. And check it out. Now we've created a very vast and dense soundscape by using this technique. We're taking up a lot of space. So it's important that you really listen to what the other players in your band are doing. For instance, let's say this type of interaction that we just went through was going on between bass and keyboards. It might not be necessary for you to play a moving part along with that. You might want to choose a soaring melody or some lush chords in the background. The point I'm trying to make is that you should really listen for space when you're writing. Listen for register and listen to what the other people are playing. This way you contribute what's right for the song as opposed to just worrying about your own little part. Remember the song comes first.
Yes, it is. This this is my full blown live setup, and uh, I guess we should start with the guitars. These are the guitars I have on the road. They're all custom Ibanez guitars made of basswood, and um, as you can see, the paint jobs on four of them are really similar. And these paint jobs are by Dan Lawrence, who does some custom work for Ibanez, and basically. I have two seven strings. This one is sort of a prototype, and this is a main one that I use. And uh, three six strings on the road. There's string gauge is nine through forty six, and the low B on this seven string is a fifty six, and they're Diodario strings. And the pickups are Demarzio. As you can see, there each guitar is the same setup, just two humbuckers and they're all direct mounted into the body there's no middle pickup at all and uh, the knob placement is so that my hands don't sort of knock into anything like on a strat you might have problem with your pinky or whatnot and uh, these pickups were custom designed by Steve Blucher for DiMarzio and um, basically one of the interesting things about these as you can see on all the other guitars is there's a one three-way toggle switch and the cool thing is that in the middle position you have the center two coils on but they're still hum canceling it gives a really sweet sort of scooped sound for clean passages uh, particularly and the frets are 6100 and it's a rosewood fretboard this is my live setup this rack was custom designed by Mark Snyder and basically you got Four Mesa Boogie cabinets, or uh, Celestian Vintage 30 speakers in those cabinets. And what's going on here is I have an amp switcher, and the amp switcher is switching between three different preamps two tri axes and a Boogie Mark II C. Everything that's in the rack, like the Crybaby and the noise gate and uh, the volume pedal and the parameter pedals are all hooked up through this multi-pin system that goes to the pedal board, which I'll show you in a second, and it makes setup very easy. And um, also, the rack has a data dump. It's an Alessis data disk that allows me to save or uh, reload any of my MIDI programs for the PCM70 or the, the uh, TC Electronics 2290 or even the Mesa Boogie tri axis So once again, on the road, it's really important to have backup and to make sure that uh, nothing goes wrong. And it's also very well shielded. All the um, grounds are isolated from the chassis, so you have no buzzes. Or once again, it's really important from venue to venue with the different sort of RF and electricity that goes on in these stages. I use these picks. These are Jim Dunlop Jazz 3s for all the electric playing. And then for acoustic, I use these Dunlap uh, 0.71 millimeter picks, which are a little bit lighter. And I play the acoustic. This is an Ibanez acoustic, and it's better for strumming and whatnot, the lighter picks. And the way it's set up over here on the stand enables me to go from electric to acoustic very quickly during the show. Just kind of come up to it and play a song. Okay, this is the pedal board that I use live, and this was custom designed by Mark Snyder once again. As you can see, here's the other end of the multi-pin that's coming in, and basically that has all your connections for the tuner and the Mesa Boogie Abacus pedal board, a parameter pedal, a volume pedal, and a watt pedal, and that includes all the AC. Just one cable right to the rack and to the pedal board. And this is how I change my patches. Basically, each patch is designed so all your effects and amp switching and whatnot happens just with the press of one button. The cool thing about this rig is that it's very versatile. So not only do I have different patches for different sounds, let me demonstrate. You have a clean sound setting, different types of clean sound settings, like some with some cool delays. And then we have some basic 
heavy rhythm sounds. And some other rhythm sounds with uh, different choruses and whatnot. And also a couple of cool lead sounds. One of the cool aspects uh, about this pedal board is the real-time control over the parameters. In other words, I can control the parameters of the tri-axis to shape the sound as I'm playing, or I can control the effects parameters to maybe add some more delay or take delay out or reverbs or whatnot. you're playing a faster line, you don't want as much around it, so you just ease off the pedal so there's not, not as, as much delay on it. So you have full control over what you're playing. Well, there you have it. We covered a lot of ground in this video and there's a lot of information to swallow. Just take your time and go through section by section and really try to get the most out of it. The best is to apply what you learn as well. I hope this has been inspiring and that you can use some of these ideas and approaches in your own playing and writing. And I had a great time doing this video. I hope to see you on tour. Bye-bye.